Hi, I'm Steve Place, and welcome to this edition of Nonprofit Spotlight. As you know, Nonprofit Spotlight is a production of the Volunteer Advisory Committee here at yes, Community Television. And every uh, program we focus on uh, one of the nonprofits in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz is kind of doing wonderful, wonderful work. We're really delighted uh, this program to have with us folks from our Santa Cruz Public Library. We have Eric Howard, who is the Assistant Director. Welcome, Eric. And Diane uh, Town, who is the communications manager. So welcome to both of you. Uh, during the uh, pandemic, uh, you know, people uh, bemoaning the fact that the libraries are not physically open for people, but certainly there's so many services still available, and we'll get into talking about that and really kind of how the library has pivoted during this time from uh, from a personal access uh, resource to something that's really now uh, virtual in, in, in many respects. But Eric, uh, for people who aren't familiar with you, tell us, uh, tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and, and how you became involved with the uh, public libraries. Uh, thanks, uh, th thank you very much for having us on and, and, and to talk about the library and what it's doing right now. We really do appreciate that. Um, my my mother, um, who is 80, is uh, a reference librarian still. Um, oh she, my her God. goal is to be the, the <laughs> oldest living reference librarian. Oh um, my God. And uh, she just was very, is very excited because she's back in New Jersey, um, where I'm from, and um, their library has been closed completely. They haven't um, um, brought up the curbside until just recently. Um, and so she's very excited to, to learn that she'll be going back to work um, in, the, in another month. Um, so she certainly inspired me. Um, I, I started supervising libraries in Queens, New York, um, and, then, and then moved out west. Um, and I took a job first out here in Palo Alto. Um, and so now I'm really super excited because this is really the place I, I, I want to be. Um, this is an incredibly uh, amazing community. I've been also super impressed to see how everyone is coming together during this crisis. Mm -hmm. um, when the library um, first started to examine this, it was actually before it came to the U.S. and we were following what was happening in China. Um, and our director, Susan Nemitz, um, directed us to begin to review um, our National Association's plan for pandemics. Um, mm -hmm. And our National, national Association um, what, had, a, had the foresight to, some time ago, develop a plan on what does a public library do during a crisis like this. Um, mm -hmm. And so we started to implement some of those uh, recommendations that we had from the association. And, and right away, we started to reorganize internally in order to prepare for the changes that we knew were going to come um and yeah yeah, and, uh, we've had Susan on uh, in the past to show uh, wonderful uh, woman and great work she does in the public library. So we're very fortunate here in Santa Cruz to have her leadership. Uh, Diane Cowan, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became involved in the public library system. Well, um, you know, I worked in a public library in the hometown where I grew up, just uh, on the San Francisco Peninsula. Um, when I moved here to go to college at UCSC, where I earned my bachelor's degree in anthropology, ah, I, um, you know, I feel really felt like I was home. I fell in love with this community, um, and I just stayed, continued working at the library. I was really inspired by the work that the library does for the community, and it just it was a, a natural fit for me. And here we are. Wonderful. Well, welcome. Yeah. Uh, as we mentioned at the top of the program, uh, there is a substantial pivoting process that needs to take place, of course, with uh, a resource which is you know, so personally you know, community oriented and in interpersonal relationships and now is being done virtually. Nevertheless, uh, many, many services still available. Uh, Eric, uh, how is that manifesting itself kind of from your point of view in terms of still providing the library services that we've all become accustomed to, to rely upon in a time when we can't really access the physical facility? Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, and our, our, our mission statement is to connect, uh, inform, and inspire. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the research right now on resiliency, one of the key components to that is how well people remain connected. And so um, it's, it's, I think now more than ever, our mission is, is, is critical. And, and that's what we recognized from the beginning. So we began with first virtual programs 
Um, and we saw a, a, a really impressive um, following on that. And, and our first response was really to help parents and families. Um, mm -hmm. We brought in um, psychologists online to work with parents to help them deal with the crisis of having their kids at home, the uncertainty, um, you know, the, the, really the trauma that, that many people are experiencing from this crisis. Um, and, and we did that to try to bring people together, which is, again, a part of our mission is to connect. While we were doing this, we were tr retraining our staff and bringing them up to speed on some new tools that we knew we would need for this crisis. Mm -hmm. And then we put into place a plan to begin to deliver curbside. Um, and we started with the holds. Um, we had thousands of people waiting for the books that they had requested at the library when the library had to shut down right away. Right. And um, we ended up calling all of them, um, hearing their stories. And um, we're talking about thousands of people um, that we reached out to. And then we slowly began to open up that curbside. And so now we have five locations um, where we're able to provide books um, to anyone who requests them. And you can request them by calling us. Mm -hmm. You can request them by going online. Um, and all this time, too, we continued with the virtual programming, um, which has continued to grow in popularity. Um, and we also never ceased. Um, we, another piece of our organization that a lot of people are not aware of is that we provide services to the jails. Um, mm -hmm. And we had to take special precautions in order to ensure that the items that we're bringing into the jails and the people that we're interacting with um, are, are careful and cautious with the vulnerable population. Um, and we've done that and continued with that. Um, so now we have five locations that we provide curbside loca uh, curbside service to. It's Felton, Scotts mm -hmm. Valley, Downtown, Aptos, and Live Oak. Um, and uh, you can find, not all of them are open on Saturday, but you can always find a location that is open on Saturday. You just need to make the request beforehand, and then you're notified when your item is there. Um, and that we, we, we do require that you wear a mask when you come to the location. Sure. To pick up the item. Let's all wear our masks, yeah. And, uh, and it's been very successful. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that you mention uh, some psychological support for parents who aren't accustomed to having their children home and in, in, the, in the home all day long. And uh, also, in the same token, the library has done such a terrific job over time of making a space for children. You know, look at the Oak Library has done. And, and so many of the, of the libraries have really had an emphasis on, on providing, you know, early childhood learning for children and, and a space to be. So it's nice that you're still making sure that those things are available. Diane, as a, as a communications manager, of course, we're all communicating differently differently in this pandemic age. And I myself, I'm just getting used to kind of you know, the virtual types of meetings and virtual types of conversations I'm having with people. How has that affected uh, your ability to kind of communicate with the community and, and really do your job? Well, you know, it has been very different. And, you know, we are really concerned that there is a demographic of people out there that do not have access to the internet or access mm -hmm. to devices and you know not only how are we going to connect with them as the library uh, but how are they going to connect with what they need in life to get things done right um, especially now that school is virtual so you know there are some real challenges with that and um that's another part of our programmatic focus now is really trying to get people connected, you know, going back to our mission. And that includes the digital divide. So, you know, all five of those branches that Eric mm -hmm. mentioned currently have Wi-Fi so people can go and park in the parking lot. And if they have their own device, use the Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working on extending it beyond the buildings. And um, we're working on some other things to hopefully create um, spaces throughout the community where where people can access at the internet at the very least. Well, it's wonderful that the uh, library has really reached out virtually in that way. I did notice on the website, uh, thankfully that you're not charging late fees. I do have one <laughs> audio book that I haven't returned. So my guy from December, delighted that's happening. And, and uh, what's been uh, very gratifying to me as a library, frequent library, uh, user is that uh, I'm, I'm a big audiobooks fan, and so I've been able to access your hoopla and think, which has just been wonderful. It's been a godsend, really, to be able to go online and be able to get the audiobooks that I'm so accustomed to having. So, those are wonderful services. 
Steve, I, I'm really thankful that you mentioned that. Um, our ebook usage is up um, of close to 50% from last year, uh -huh. not surprisingly. Uh, so there are movies, there are free movies that you can watch. Um, we had a program last night um, that previewed a movie, a document, not previewed, but watched a documentary and then discussed it um, from Canopy, um, which has <laughs> fantastic uh, yeah. uh, um, movies and documentaries. Um, and 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 that was discussed last night um, through one of the pro library programs, and it was in a partnership with the Friends of the Library. Um, but I wanted to just mention that if if people haven't used an ebook or downloaded a, a, an audio book or, or downloaded a free movie or music as well, and you'd like to discover how to do that, you can call us, and we will, we will walk you through it um, and, and help you out. So it's and I think people are really surprised at how easy it is um, to do that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean you have to give up the physical book. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yes, you can do both. You can do both. Good point. Yeah. I, I think it's really fascinating that uh, as much as we see ourselves as kind of a, of a digital age and people being very conversant with the internet, uh, many people in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County aren't. They haven't been to this extent. And when they uh, they realize that, my gosh, I can still go online and get my books and get my movies, I can do all the things that I've been able to do to that relied on my my library system to provide uh, that's terrific and and as well you, you're doing so many other kinds of things virtually that uh, that really are benefiting the community in terms of providing information or connecting people and those kinds of things are still main, being maintained that no that's it's right Stephen and I, and I would be um, remiss if I didn't point out that you know these challenges have hit the entire community in, in, in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. the, the needs have gone up and we're trying really hard to respond to the, to the increased needs that our community has right now. And, and then I'd be remiss to, 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 to not bring up the fact that we've also had to let go 62 of our, of our, of our workers. Oh um, and so, and then we've also taken a 10% cut. Um, so that means a 10% cut in, our, in the time that we get from our staff um, so that their salaries have been reduced by 10% as well. Um, and, and we're, st and we have an amazing, amazing staff. Um, they are, we're, I'm very fortunate that I work with people like Diane and, and, and so many who are so passionate about trying to, figure out how we can meet people's needs during this time. And um, the question that we get asked most often, of course, is when are we going to open the doors again and have people exactly. back in your life? <laughs> and, and we desperately want to be able to do that. Um, we're, we're, we're carefully following the guidelines, um, not just from the state, but the best practices that we have from our national association mm -hmm. for libraries. Mm -hmm. So that means, for instance, that when you return a book, and you don't have to rush to return your item. We're, 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 we have lots of items that are being returned right now, um, but um, you don't have to rush, as, as, as you mentioned, we're not charging um, fees. Thank goodness. <laughs> and, and then what we do with them is we hold them up, we hold them in quarantine for 72 hours, even though there's a very minimal risk um, that we know from materials handling. Um, this, this is a disease that is primarily spread um, by speaking, and that's why the mask wearing is right, so critical right, yeah, yeah. and the distancing is so important. But just to be extremely careful, what we do is we, we hold the items for 72 hours um, mm -hmm. before they get back into circulation. That typically means that they don't go back out right away anyways, but that way we are also protecting our staff. Um, and that does slow things up a little bit, but I'm also, I'm not just a library worker, I'm also a patron. Absolutely. And, uh, and so I just made a request um, for a couple items uh, at Scotts Valley and I um, had a break between meetings and I drove over there. It, it's amazing, despite all of the disruptions and the fact that we basically had to internally recreate the way our systems operate they still were able to get it to me and i and i and i what you do is you drive up if it's a drive up it's like scotts valley is um you you just call uh that connects you with a staff person right away and in less than just a couple of minutes they were outside um with my item and um and then i was able to drive off so it really is an amazing system that we were able to to, to change up um, um immediately and there's a lot more that goes into um libraries than just what is what people think of as retail, um, mm -hmm. because 
it's a, it's a system that still has to respect privacy in a, in a way that retail uh, really doesn't have the same sort of professional um, guidelines that they have to follow when it comes to privacy. Um, and then, we're, of course, we're recirculating items, unlike retail. Um, so it's a, it's a loan process. Of course. Um, and, and so we have to, there's, 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 there's a lot behind the scenes that, that goes into this operation. But I am just very impressed with staff that have been able to, to manage that change. Um, and manage it with significantly less staff um, than we ever have had before. Right, and it's such a, a it's such a cherished resource. Uh, the longtime love affair between the community and the library system is something that uh, people really really appreciate, and as a, and to a certain extent, uh, certainly rely upon. Um, and historically, libraries have been uh, to at least a certain extent volunteer driven. How are you handling that now with people who say, gosh, I still want to be involved in my library physically in some ways. Is there any opportunity for people to, anything you need from the community for people who are willing to volunteer their time and effort? That, that's a, that's a, Diane, did you want to answer that? Um, I'd be happy to, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> we, I mean, we both can. I, 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 I love that question, um, and we we really cherish our volunteers. At this time, because of the the the, the guidance from the health office, we are not um, having volunteers in the buildings or, or helping us with their operations. But there are things that we're doing virtually. Um, and last night, the partnership that we had with the Friends of the Library, right. um, which is fantastic, they primarily ran that program. Um, that and as Diane said trying to understand too what the community needs so that we can figure out what the resources are that the library can provide to match those needs. Um, that's also critically helpful. And I think Diane had some, some more to say on that. Yeah. Our volunteer coordinator is uh, looking for really good volunteer opportunities that for our current volunteers, and she's mm -hmm. also recruiting for specific skills to really help you know, enhance the programs that we do. So a lot of the volunteer opportunities are gonna be very different in that, you know, perhaps a volunteer uh, is delivered, you know, some sort of materials, they construct something at home, they, you know, there's a lot of different opportunities, um, right. particularly in the field of technology, you know, and teaching. Um, I think I think that we'll hear more from mm -hmm. our volunteer office about opportunities to stay connected as a volunteer. Well, I echo what uh, Eric says about the Friends of the, uh, the Library. We had them on before on shows. They're a wonderful group. I mean, tremendous support for the library. And so, uh, as I was saying, uh, even during this pandemic, uh, library is offering so many opportunities for services, for support, to let the community know that it still is a, 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 an available resource to them. But in a broader sense, of course, the library is always expanding and improving itself. And uh, of course, Capitola and Felton a couple of projects going on, and we were discussing just briefly uh, the proposed uh, new downtown library. But Derek, tell us a little bit about uh, how those projects are going. Like, could give people an idea about uh, the general sense of it. Right. Thanks. Um, construction hasn't stopped, um, and you know, it's it's uh, we have this. It's sad because we had Felton, um, which if. You didn't get a chance to visit it before we had to close the libraries because of the health crisis. Uh -huh. uh, I want to remind everyone, I have to remind myself, <laughs> this is not going to last forever. Right. Um, we, we, we will be opening the doors again. Um, we have some amazing buildings right now, and we have some amazing buildings um, that, that are planned for the future as well. Um, Felton was, was our most uh, recent one. Um, it is a, it's a stunning building inside. Um, I'm so I'm thankful that we had the celebration to open it up to everyone just prior to um, getting hit with this health crisis so that right, we had right. that, that experience to, to celebrate with the community there. Um, but in addition to that, we'll be opening up Capitola soon. And uh, there's still a lot of uncertainty around when those doors will actually open. Mm -hmm. And that's really primarily uh, a result or a function of this health crisis. Um, so. We, we will be reporting out on some updates on that. Um, and I just wanted to remind viewers that um, we have a board meeting uh, on August 6th. And you can find that more information about how to, to, to view that. You can view that online. 
Um, you can participate in that. And we're actually seeing, just as we are with our virtual programming, we're actually seeing, in some cases, higher numbers than we ever had when we actually had the doors open. So oh, something that that right? to, yeah, and it's something for us to consider once we open the doors, to what extent are we going to have like a hybrid model of keeping programming virtually so that we provide that access to individuals and and then you know we'll of course have it in the in the libraries once we open as well but um, I would I would suspect that we'll probably continue this function um, once we open up with our board meetings because it's a great way to get community participation um, and we also have a library advisory commission um, which is a citizen based um, group mm -hmm. of folks um, who help advise us on policy um, but uh, but on August six we'll be reporting out on the updates for all the construction projects um, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Capitola will be the one that will be coming up um, the, the soonest, but a lot will depend, of course, on the health crisis and, and where we are with that. Um, in addition to Capitola, we have 10 buildings all together throughout the system. Um, we're, we're a joint powers uh, organization. Mm -hmm. um, so what that means is that my boss, Susan, reports to a board. The board um, is represented by, or it, it represents the, is the city manager for Scotts Valley, Capitola, um, and Santa Cruz, um, and then the county administrator. Um, and so we're separate from the Watsonville library system. Um, but our bookmobile, which we also has, have uh, heads, heads out in that direction as well, along with across the entire county. Um, but on August 6, um, we'll be reporting out on what we're doing as a system, but also what we'll be doing um, with the 10 libraries um, that in 2016, um, the library received, a, 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 got a bond measure passed, um, was over 70% supported it, mm -hmm. um, provided over $67 million. Uh, and so we are busy at work um, refurbishing some libraries um, doing new construction with others, a, a new construction that will um, go forward will be at the Aptos Library. Um, so um, we'll, we'll be seeing that um, com uh, completely new space there in a couple of years. Um, the library projects typically take about two years um, once if it's, if it's a brand new one. And um, so that's that'll be the next big project. Um, but we also have other projects that we're we're excited to be opening. We we refurbished um, that beautiful uh, library in La Selva, um, oh, really? and, okay. and uh, so and that's that's still uh, under construction, and they're 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 still moving forward with that. Um, we're going to be making updates to the Scotts Valley Library, um, to the library in Boulder Creek. Um, and um, and then also we're going to be really redoing, um, and it's going to feel like a new library for Branch of Forty, uh, oh uh -huh. and um, yeah. So that's the Branch of Forty. Um, that'll be that'll probably take a little bit longer. I think they're looking at like twenty twenty two. Um, so um, sometime uh, probably around the same time that, that the Aptos Library opens up, and then we're also refurbishing um, Garfield as well. Um, so we're, we've been very busy. We've never stopped working on the on the construction projects um, and um, trying to figure out how to update these libraries um, so that they meet the needs um, today for everyone. I, I think it's very reassuring uh, for the community to know that this progress is still being made. And as I say, uh, the library system is really such a cherished resource in Santa Cruz, uh, has been, uh, continues to be, and it's an interesting point uh, that uh, when the libraries do reopen, uh, how many people will continue to access virtually that really yeah. never did that before. And so it's right. really setting up a system for people to be more comfortable with that and say, you know what, geez, I like my uh, audio books, I just get those online. You know, and, but, but there is something about for those of us who just love libraries and love being in libraries to be able to go physically walk through the doors. Uh, Diane, are you now? Are you working from home? Are you working uh, with, with the uh, library system itself in physically? I am working from home. Oh, one, day a, one day a week, I do help with curb, curbside service, and then uh -huh. I'm available to you know help out if needed for that. But I've been home since March. I might die. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I know that we're running short on time, and I did want to make Please. a little plug for our summer reading program. Oh, absolutely. So uh, today would have been the last day, but, you know, it's been such a, you know, different summer. So yes. decided to extend 
the summer reading program to August 15th. Um, that will allow, I mean, honestly, you could still sign up during this time. Good. Record all the reading that you've done all summer and then redeem your rewards. So kids 11 and under get a free book after reading five hours and uh, everybody else gets a coupon for the friends for a free book after reading five hours. And all kids 18 and under get a certificate for a, a comic at Atlanta's Fantasy World, our great partner. So, and that was another program that really, we had to pivot quickly to make it happen all online. And I just want to really give kudos to all the people that work with youth in our library system. They are so dedicated. Mm. You know, they put together kits of crafts and STEM education kits to bring to free lunch sites throughout the summer so that kids have um, ways to learn and, and make and create. And um, just, I want to thank all of our staff for that. Well, that's terrific. And you know, the library is a wonderful resource for children of all ages, but it, uh, I would be, be remiss uh, if I didn't, if I didn't mention what a great job the library does serving, serving children, serving youth, you know, really make, introducing them to the wonders of the library. Uh, Eric uh, and Diane, we've got about a minute or so. Uh, what's the future of the library system looking like uh, through the pandemic and maybe as we peek out uh, uh, the other side a bit? I Thanks. Thank you very much, David. Thanks, Diane, for saying that about our staff. Um, yeah. we, we are going to continue to, to be innovative. Um, and as Diane said, you know, we, we still um, have people out there. We, we've, we've met with hundreds and hundreds of families at school lunch sites at nine different sites across the, the, the county mm -hmm. um, on, on a weekly basis, yeah. um, meeting with those families and helping them out. Uh, we'll continue with that work. We'll also continue to create this hybrid um, version that we've developed where we have story time now, live story time online. Um, we have live adult programming online and we'll continue to do that in, in these amazing buildings that we're creating. And, um, and we'll continue to look to the, to, to, to the public to find out how we can meet their needs and so that we can continue uh, to support our community uh, during this time and beyond. Well, speaking of behalf, please, Diane. We are asking for your input for oh, your good. needs. Uh, for ev you know, everybody in the community is invited to email me at virtual services at Santa Cruz PL dot right. and share your story of resilience. Give us recommendations about how the library could help you through this time. Um, I'm really, we, we really do want to connect with you out there in our community and work together to get through this. And check out our calendar online. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thanks uh, on behalf of the community for all the wonderful work you do. Uh, we would not be the community we are without our public library system. So Eric Howard, Assistant Director, uh, Diane Cowan, uh, Communications Manager, thank you so much for your work. Thank you so much for your continuing work. Uh, the community thanks you. I thank you. And Nonprofit Spotlight thanks you. Thanks for being here. Thank I've you very much. Late. Thanks for uh, having us. Join us next time for another nonprofit spotlight when we look at another wonderful uh, nonprofit in Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County. We'll see you then. <music>